Hello and welcome to St. Matthew Lutheran Church of Milwaukee. This is the service for October 6th, 2024, the 20th Sunday after Pentecost. We begin by singing, Dearest Jesus, We Are Here. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, commanded baptism when he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. All of us are born into this world with a deep need for baptism. From our parents we inherit a sinful nature. We are without true fear of God and true faith in God and are condemned to eternal death. But while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He took away our sin by giving his life on the cross. In baptism, he clothes us with the robe of his righteousness and gives us a new life. We recall what baptism means for our daily lives. 
Baptism means that the sinful nature in us should be drowned by daily sorrow and repentance, and that all its evil deeds and desires be put to death. It also means that a new person should daily arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. As baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Holy, Holy God, God, gracious, gracious Father, Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me a sinner. God saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit and united us to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Every day God forgives your sins, removes your guilt, and strengthens you to defeat Satan's power. His promise is for you and your children, and he will never forsake you. Your sins are forgiven. You are clothed with Christ. You are at peace with God now and forever. Amen. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. 
and also with you. Let us pray. Loving God and Father, the blessings of marriage and family come from your gracious pleasure and careful design. Lead all who value these gifts to follow your path of wisdom so that they may enjoy the fullness of your love. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 18. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with Psalm 127. Our second reading is from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesians, beginning at chapter 5, verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. 
Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We acclaim the gospel. The Gospel reading serves as the sermon text, and it has the theme, Think Little. We read from Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 2. Some Pharisees came and tested Jesus by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you, he replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. 
we sing, O oh, bless the house, whatever befall. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God, our Heavenly Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, think big. Think big. That's the advice given to people starting a business. Don't just think of selling things in the neighborhood. Think national, think, think global, think big. They say to sports teams, don't just think about having a, a 500 record, think about winning the championship, think about winning it all. That advice can, can have its place, but as we heard in the gospel reading, Jesus says, think little. Well, he didn't precisely say, think little, but he did say, truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Of course, we want to receive the kingdom of God, to have him ruling graciously in our hearts to have us living with him forever in his heavenly kingdom. And so Jesus tells us to think little with humble trust and with bold enthusiasm. Little children are well known for their great trust in their parents. If mom or dad has said something, they believe it. Sometimes a little child will even believe something rather outrageous, which the parents spoke only as a joke, but they'll hang on to that and insist that must be the case. The little child doesn't get sidetracked about how illogical or unreasonable something is. They simply trust whatever the parent has said. We heard that the Pharisees who were coming to ask Jesus questions were not trusting him, but were testing him. When they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? 
they were hoping to get him to say something that they could pounce on. If, they, if Jesus said, no, it's, it's not lawful, then they could point to the great Moses and say, well, he allowed divorce. And if Jesus said, well, yes, it is lawful, they could pounce on that and accuse Jesus of not upholding God's law. But as ever, they and their tricky testing questions were no match for Jesus. There's not that one time recorded in scripture where at last they got him. They, they never got him. As he often did, Jesus turned the question back to them, asking what Moses commanded in this area. And they acknowledged that Moses permitted divorces. But before anyone could walk away thinking that God was pleased with these divorces taking place among his people, Jesus added this, it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. It was just a way of minimizing the damage that was done through divorce that God commanded Moses to bring some order to the nation of Israel in this matter. In this specific instance, Jesus is teaching about marriage, and we are to think little, think like a little child when God gives us simple straightforward instructions about marriage. One man, one woman, stick together for life. No one should break that marriage through adultery. No one should abandon that marriage by deserting. For these reasons, as Jesus says elsewhere in the gospel, God, like Moses, permits divorce, but it is not as though God has ever been or ever will be pleased with a situation which brings the end of marriage before death parts them. This simple childlike trust, of course, doesn't just apply to marriage, but to everything God has revealed to us. Today, as we heard again the account of creation and all of the animals coming before Adam so that he could name them, we might say, well, that sounds like the stuff of, of little children's book. It is. The Bible is a book for little children of God like us, for all believers to read and to say, God has said it happened this way, so it did happen this way. The same with the creating of the first woman, Eve, this deep sleep God placed Adam into in taking a rib. Again, like a little child who doesn't stop and say, that's illogical, that's unreasonable, we say, this is what happened, because God says this is what happened. Humble trust applies again to all of what he has said. When God teaches us about finding our greatest joy and satisfaction in him, he means it. When we hear in the psalm, I will say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. We are to believe that, like little children, that if we have the Lord and his promises and his comfort, we have all that we need. We believe like little children when in the New Testament God says the same thing. Godliness with contentment is great gain. God explaining that the measure of really being ahead in this world, of really making it, is not the size of the bank account or the home or the number of vehicles. It's being content with what he has given us. We are rich in him 
when we know and trust in the riches of his grace and mercy. When we have a humble trust that what he has already given us is a greater treasure than anything else in all the world. Most of all, we trust that direct promise that we are rescued from our sins. We believe that his death on the cross changed everything and that his resurrection from the grave guarantees eternal life to us. Those things can seem as illogical and unreasonable as some of the things a parent might say to their child just as a joke and the child ends up believing it, but we know our God is not joking. He's promising us that the sacrifice of his son, the innocent lamb on the cross, is the payment for every sin and that all who believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. With humble faith, we think little. We think like a little child and we say, if my father in heaven says that his son's death on a cross means life for me, then it does. If he tells me that he has loved me since before the world even began and he will love me forever long after the world is gone. I believe that. I humbly trust and rejoice in these great promises. Think of his invitation to us to call upon me in every trouble. He will hear us. He will deliver us. If we apply big people thinking to that invitation, we can get off track easily. We can think that, no, some things are just too big of a problem for, for God to handle as though his arms were not quite that powerful for us. Or on the other side, we might think that something is just too little to bother him with. But like little children, Take him at his invitation. Call upon me in every trouble. Take him at his word and invitation to pray. Take him up on that enthusiastically. And that's a big part about thinking little as well. These children that were brought to Jesus seem to have been pretty little. We heard Jesus took them in his arms. There's no indication that Jesus had to chase them down or that the parents had to force them into his arms. It seems Jesus just took them and they gladly, eagerly came. Now, for people who have been raised with the concept of stranger danger, this may seem a little unsettling. They hadn't met Jesus, they'd heard about him, and then they were letting this Jesus hold their children. But of course there was no danger here. This was the perfect Savior. So maybe we want, when we talk about little ones running eagerly to the embrace of the Lord Jesus, we of course say don't say stranger danger. Maybe we should say something like savior behavior, the right and safe and good behavior when it comes to our savior is to boldly, eagerly, with enthusiasm, go to our savior. Be wrapped in the arms of his love and mercy and forgiveness. We need to think little like that. We need to think like a, a little child who eagerly proclaims, my dad is the strongest or my mom is the smartest. In the case of our God in heaven, those things are true. He is the wisest. He is the most powerful, all-powerful, all-knowing God. 
When we hear the disciples rebuking the people for bringing their little children to Jesus, we of course find that ridiculous. How could they dare suggest that parents hold their children back from Jesus' embrace? But it's no less ridiculous when we do not make the bringing of our children to the Savior's arms and to his words our highest priority. But of course it won't likely become a high priority for our children if it's not for us. If we drag our feet about hearing God's word, that lack of enthusiasm shows to anyone around us in our family or elsewhere. Holy Spirit, give us a bold enthusiasm which keeps saying to our God, speak, Lord, your servants, your little children are listening. A dramatic example of a lack of enthusiasm for learning the words of the Savior showed itself years ago at one of the churches near where I served in, as a pastor in Michigan. Ahead of the Sunday school year, a parent actually approached the Sunday school teachers and asked this question. What is the fewest number of times the kids could come to Sunday school and still get to sing on Christmas Eve? What a tragically low bar they were setting. What a disturbing lack of enthusiasm for learning the life-giving word of the Lord, the only word that saves. Let's avoid similar questions, whether saying them out loud or just by our actions, saying, well, what's the fewest number of times I could manage to get to church and still keep that all-important saving faith. Only God knows what that number is, but any of us can know that that is a spiritually dangerous approach. To set the bar so low, to wonder what's the least I could be involved with God's gospel, with the good news of salvation, and still hang on to faith. Let's not be unenthusiastic about the only message there is that brings us forgiveness and life and peace. We all fall short in our enthusiasm in different ways. When we hear God's instruction on marriage today again, we can think of all kinds of ways we fall short in doing those things, in, in loving one another and, and serving one another. And we all, single or married, parent or child, we all need to keep going to the foot of the cross and knowing that all of those shortcomings are paid for and forgiven. And at the cross, may we exclaim like a small child might say when surprised by a gift, that small child might ask, for me? May we ask that about this gift of forgiveness and life and realize that the answer is yes. Yes, it is for you. And ironically, it is only when we think little that we begin to realize how big God's mercy and power are. That when he says, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, purifies you from every sin, we need to believe that as a little child and realize how big his forgiveness is, how big his promises are. And as we spoke of a business thinking big in the beginning and realizing that they should maybe be thinking even globally, we're reminded that only by believing like little children, 
the command of the Savior to go out into all the world, only through childlike faith in that promise did that small group centuries ago go out into the world and share this message with all. When we are thinking little in faith, believing as a little child believes, then we're eager to be part of sharing this same message of mercy. Amen. We join in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Loving Lord, according to your wisdom and will, you bring us together into families. We pray today for the special interests of our Christian homes. In your mercy, hear us, Lord. Make our families dwellings of joy and schools of character. Grant to those who are married true love and unbreaking loyalty for the sake of their children to be models in their communities and for the welfare of society. In your mercy, hear us, Lord. Protect us from the spiritual enemies of our household, from quick temper, cranky moods, thoughtless words, and selfish pleasures which rob marriage of love and deprive childhood of joy. In your mercy, hear us, Lord. Guide and guard us as we move through the changes of family life, from early joys to hectic support to aging reflection. Provide the wisdom we need to enjoy the transitions of life. In your mercy, hear us, Lord. For the sake of our society, whose foundations are in the family, we pray for the homes of others. Spare men and women from marriage vows lightly planned, carelessly made, and easily broken. In your mercy, hear us, Lord. Protect us and others from evils which deplete households, degrade children, cheapen love, and dishonor old age. In your mercy, hear us, Lord. Hear our prayers for our extended families and for the family of believers. Channel your strength to those who are hurting without healing and to those who grieve without comfort. Calm the distraught and give guidance to the confused. Hold those we love in the arms of your grace. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. O oh Lord, for the sake of your Son and with the power of your Spirit, 
Give us strength and wisdom to build our homes in the shadow of your gracious and forgiving love. In your mercy, hear us, Lord, and grant us your blessings. Amen. Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy Thy kingdom come, come, thy thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We join in the closing hymn. Moved by God's sure promises and his enduring mercy, we have had the privilege of worshiping him again this hour. We hope that you can join us in person sometime at St. Matthew Lutheran Church. We are located at 8444 West Melvina Street in Milwaukee. On Sunday, we worship at 9 a.m. On Mondays at 6.30 p.m. God be with you and yours until we meet again.